All right. So I think it's uh, it's my slot now. So we're it's, we're good to go and start right away. Yes. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about security and security uh, vulnerability database. Um, so let me make sure I hide that stuff. I hope you can see the screen at the moment. You can, is it, is it all right? Yes, everything all right. Good. Um, so just one fun fact about me. I'm, my, my claim to fame is that I, I'm probably one of the person that has deleted the most code in the Linux kernel. And I didn't write a line there. I'm only deleted, deleted code and contribute deletion. Actually, this was not even code, it was comment, uh, but tens of thousands of lines of comment. And, and the fun fact is that this was to, to actually inject SPDX license expression in the kernel and replace uh, uh, boilerplate uh, license notices. Uh, that's something to help with. All right. So what we'll be talking uh, today about is uh, the, the problem of uh, security uh, vulnerability database and the information about uh, vulnerable packages, basically. And there's, there's something weird today is that most of the software vulnerability database uh, about known free and open source software packages are actually privately maintained and proprietary, which is surprising, right? After all, our, our, our code is, is, is free. Why, why wouldn't data about that could be free too? And so what we're, what we're working on is building a new set of force tool and database to, to actually help fill that gap and ensure that we can have uh, accessible and useful and usable set of data about which package has a vulnerability and, and how to find out about that. That's the, the gist of it. Um, let me get you access, Matt. Sure. Okay, um, so wh why does it matter? First, um, having component packages, libraries that have non software vulnerabilities is, uh, Philip, is a serious sorry yes. for uh, interrupting. Uh, I think uh, uh, you are sharing uh, the presentation in presentation mode, but we are still. Uh, ah, ha, ha, uh, ha, ha, the, ha. Yeah. So I was not sharing the right thing. Okay, fair enough. Uh, thanks for the, the thing. Okay, so let me get back to sharing the things correctly. I'm going to share my whole desktop. That's going to be much easier. All right. I was not sharing the entire screen, and that showed. Okay. And we should be able to see the whole thing now, yeah. right? Here we Good. are. Thanks. Okay. So. The agenda, I'll present the problem and context and the, the, the element of solution we're working on. And this is what I was uh, talking about a second ago. So the, the problem is that most of the database, that there's an industry of uh, proprietary commercial software database, software vulnerability database for open source software which also covers proprietary software, but it's, it's really weird that it's not done with open data and open code. And that's the, the thing we're trying to solve here. Um, especially one thing that I feel is really important is if you think of it, security data is a bit like, uh, like oxygen. You don't want to put a tax on oxygen. Uh, you want it to be free for everyone. And, and that's probably more important than, than anything else. Uh, I, I could go as far as saying that even if the, the software wasn't free, uh, as in free software, um, you'd want still the data about software security and vulnerabilities being free itself. So why does it matter? Of course, um, using vulnerable software is problematic. There's, there's a new vulnerability that popped up today on, on uh, LWN and, and there was a discussion around the kernel, which is 
a, a vulnerability in the Bluetooth stack, which on Linux, which is super easily uh, exploitable. So if you're using Bluetooth on your laptop today, uh, you want to make sure you either use a bleeding edge kernel or get the patches, which may not have landed in old distros, probably not in the Ventuse yet, or turn off Bluetooth. So that's the kind of things you, 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 you want to care about. It's considered as one of the test 10 most critical uh, issue uh, by OWASP. And it's one of the top actually. Um, and the, the difficulty is that uh, we, we have, as I said, independent uh, proprietary database on, on the one end, but not only these databases are often proprietary, the underpinning data uh, are often, uh, and the design of this data uh, was often done for proprietary software in mind. So there's concept like uh, vendors, uh, which is great when you're actually selling software. Uh, it doesn't work very well for a library. Uh, for instance, who is the vendor of Zlib or the vendor of OpenSSL? It really depends. There's no such thing as like one vendor and I'm not sure it's for sale anyway. Um, the other problem is that too often the, the information is uh, scattered and, and there's no comprehensive place where you can get it all. And the main thing that resembles some kind of a shared database, something called the National Vulnerability Database in the US, which is maintained by the, the Department of Commerce and, and uh, um, has contracted the company called MITRE um, to, to actually maintain that data. Uh, but that is essentially dependent on national vol on uh, voluntary submissions. And that makes it difficult because, you know, uh, very often there's not either lack of knowledge about the existence and the need to do these submissions. And on the other hand also, uh, if it's a voluntary submission, that's difficult because you, you rely on the goodwill of people. <clears throat> and, and so we all know that usage of free and open source software has been exploding. And really what we need is something which is a new and efficient approach to identify software security vulnerabilities. So ideally, if you have a, a kernel before version 5.9, we'd want to know that there is a vulnerability in the kernel, in the Bluetooth stack that you can fix by upgrading with uh, to kernel, whatever version, really right now, I don't know because it sits actually in a tree and it's been, not been merged yet. Um, but that's the kind of thing you'd like to know and you'd be able to, you'd want to know uh, quickly and efficiently. And not only for the kernel, but for the thousands of packages that run on any server or desktop we run today. Um, and there's a lot of them. So I talked briefly about the NVD National Vulnerability Database for those that, that don't know about that. It, it really predates uh, the existence of free software uh, by quite a bit of margin or maybe not exactly, but it didn't care too much about that. It's been mostly centered originally in terms of its design on dealing with uh, vulnerabilities in Windows, for instance, or Acrobat Reader and, and this kind of thing. So uh, very much centered around uh, the, the, the ways and means of uh, proprietary software. And it's also able to, to handle things like hardware, uh, which is interesting, I'm sure, for, for many, but uh, it's very far from using a node package or, or a Ruby gem or Python wheel in a modern software application. Um, and it's, it's, they use a way to identify software component, which is called CP for Command Platform Enumeration, which really makes it difficult to relate to software component and library. And it's a well-known problem. Uh, so much so that uh, uh, there, there's, uh, there's work going on in the NTIA to actually find replacement for, for the CP because it's, uh, it has quite a bit of independence mismatch with the way we deal with software. Again, the notion of vendor is one. Um, there's a certain number of assumptions which are made about also uh, the way versions are dealt with. And, and we all know versions is difficult uh, when, when you deal with a distro, being able to 
handle consistently version numbers across all the different packages, which all have a different version scheme, is a difficult thing. And as I said, it's only a subset of non vulnerabilities. Um, it's very possible that you have your own open source project and you have a vulnerability issue. You're going to have a ticket in the bug tracker. You're going to solve it. Uh, maybe you'll put a note in the change log if it's major or not. And, and really, this information that there was a bug that has a security impact on top of time and it's been fixed is buried somewhere in your bug tracker and nowhere else available. And there's also a lot of fragmented data source. I mean, there's, there's data from uh, uh, for SUSE and OpenSUSE. There's from uh, Red Hat and Fedora and Debian and Ubuntu and uh, Django as its own security tracker. And there's uh, another thing for OpenSSL and, and so on and so on. And there's really a lot of fragmentation there. As a result, there's been the emergence of a data aggregation uh, industry, uh, which has been essentially commercial, which are trying to collect all this data and, and resell it uh, uh, commercially. So our solution is simple, is to uh, independently, independently aggregate many software vulnerabilities data source in one single database, such it can be really easily uh, recreated and centralized and correlated together. And to have a, a new and practical uh, uniform software package identification, which is based on something called package URL. Uh, you can check it on, on GitHub. It's a shared spec. It's a project that we started, but happens to be also used by OWASP projects now. Uh, uh, folks at Red Hat have been using it. Um, folks at uh, Sonata type on Maven. Uh, there's a project, the Linux Foundation, that's considering using it, and so on. So it's it's a very simple scheme to identify a package based on its name and version. And there's not much more to it than that, and, and a type. So for instance, a package from uh, uh, SUSE would be identified as type RPM, and being from SUSE as a distribution, and then it would have a name and, and a version. So nothing rocket science, but it's 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 clicking with a lot of people because it just fills a void and and there was nothing we really need to deal with a way to uh, identify this package in a uniform way and that's really important because again uh, you want to know which package you have and which one is subject to a security issue then on top of that we're providing a, a search uh, to be able to find if uh, we have known package that have vulnerabilities. And later on, we will be looking at crowdsourcing and doing peer review and classification, uh, which is another problem. This industry also, because it's been essentially driven by commercial interest, there's, there's a strong interest to have more vulnerabilities. Bigger is better. Uh, in practice, bigger is not better. I don't care about a security vulnerability that's not exploitable ever or uh, I would care about it, uh, maybe in some case, but I'd like to know what's the severity of it in practical terms. And it's today that's, that's something that's been essentially delegated to uh, uh, MITRE, uh, paid work by, by the, the national, uh, the, the US Commerce Department and the National Variety Database. And it's been a pipeline that's been severely clogged. Um, and it's also highly subjective. So I think it would be much better to have actually developers and the authors and users of the software and software libraries and package being able to do this classification and share this information because uh, that's in everyone's best interest to know that, uh, as an example, there's a well-known vulnerability for Django, which is rated as the highest vulnerability, uh, severity, and criticality. Um, except it only happens if you run Django in debug mode. So there's you, you need to have your debug mode enabled, which is unlikely in production unless you're, you're really uh, uh, careless. All the, all the other case it doesn't happen, but it would show up if you just detect Django as being installed. What, what we want to do eventually later on is also figure out that, okay, you have Django installed and 
it has this setting enabled, which means that you have debug enabled, in which case the security vulnerability applies. Otherwise, it, it shouldn't be even mentioned that there is such thing. So uh, the way we, we're going at it is uh, building, of course, free and open source software. And what we, we care for is uh, to work based on data that is the data that identify packages either found in package manifest, such as a package.json or the fact that it's a maven jar, or usually you wouldn't see that typically, but it could be an RPM header in a binary RPM. Uh, but more typically, uh, installed package database, whether it's uh, uh, in containers, virtual machine, or, or, or other type of uh, root file system. And uh, being able to leverage to and detect, uh, leverage any, any of the tools that can detect and report these package URLs I've talked about. Uh, one of my tools called ScanCode does that, but that's not the only one nowadays. Um, and next, what we're working on is to, to be able to correlate uh, vulnerabilities between different software package by mining the, the graph we have there. Very practically, if I know that OpenSSL upstream has a vulnerability and it's also available in uh, OpenSUSE, so that's pretty straightforward, right? simple. But it may also be bundled in a node package in JavaScript that contains uh, OpenSSL bundled and vendored and statically laying there. And that's the kind of thing you want to know and being able to say, okay, if I have this vulnerability in OpenSSL, then it also may impact the JavaScript package, which there's nothing obvious about that at first. Uh, uh, it's probably much easier to, to deal with it in the context of uh, distro package, because we know what's upstream and there were some presentation earlier on on the topic. Um, but in the case of uh, application package, packages, things are, are much more murky. So package URLs, I, I've talked a bit about it, quite a bit actually. Um, this is what it looks like. Uh, it has a PKG prefix, a column, a type, a slash, and then possibly a namespace or no namespace and just a name, an add sign and a version. And there's more subtleties than that, but that's the gist of it. It's, it's obvious, it's simple, it's clear, it's self-evident what it means, uh, and, and uh, it's pretty useful and powerful to identify packages on, on a large scale. So what we do in terms of being able to collect data, we aggregate and collect and parse data from any source. So we have a common data model to minimally identify packages and minimally identify vulnerabilities. And we essentially building correlation and, and cross references to, to build a graph. And the data we're going after are first and foremost the national voting database at the bottom, but also we're looking at bug trackers, eventually change logs, project specific trackers, you know, uh, OpenSSL publishes an XML file that contains its known vulnerabilities. There's also application package trackers uh, which provide security information. And later on, we'll go also after their issue trackers and change logs if we don't have uh, uh, full information available directly in the uh, in these trackers. And of course, the, the distro trackers and Suzy being one on one, one of them, which in some case use a command format. We'll come to that. There's uh, something called CVRF, command vulnerability reporting format, and of all, which is uh, open vulnerability assessment language, both uh, derive more or less from the, the, the realm of the national vulnerability database, which are XML-based formats, which provides uh, some level of standardization, but they're not like universally adopted. They're adopted by major distro like Suze, Red Hat, and, and so on. So that's a lot of data. Uh, uh, the data model is deceptively simple we have a vulnerability where we keep really minimal information and many references to many places where this vulnerability may exist and where we have details, information about uh, its, uh, its, well, whatever, its history, how it was detected, we detected it and so on. Uh, 
And what we really care for is the fact that there's a package identified by a package URL, and eventually a range or a series of package. Uh, that is related to a vulnerability, and we know which vulnerability a package is vulnerable to, and when a package is fixed and no longer vulnerable. And so the project's called Vulnerable Code. Um, it's, it's, there's a, a, a Gitter channel, and, and also uh, it's also accessible via IRC. Uh, it was started with an initial grant of the European Union. Actually, it started by as a Google Summer of Code project. Uh, then we received a bit of a grant from the European Union. Well enough, we're, we're a US-based company, but uh, um, they really like what we, what we had to do there uh, as a, an open and free both uh, software and data solution. And sponsored by my own company too. Um, and what we're doing there is very simply we're we're able to answer questions saying is foo version one is it known to to be vulnerable? What's the vulnerability? What's the severity? And if there's a vulnerability that's known there, which version has a fix? Because very practically, in the vast majority of the case. Uh, Upgrading is, is most of the time the cure. I mean, you could backport fixes and patches, and, and that's what software distribution uh, distributors, uh, package, so distro maintainers and package maintainers do, which is to backport fix uh, quite often. Uh, very often, it's, it's really upgrading to the latest and greatest is the solution. It's not always possible, but that's the solution. In the future, uh, we also want to introduce and know very precisely what is the commit that introduced the bug on the one end, and which one is the fix. And that has a lot of uh, potential applications, such as uh, uh, there's a project we, we're started collaborating with at Eclipse called Eclipse Steady, uh, such as being able to find in binaries and, and doing code execution analysis also, if a certain vulnerable code pass is being uh, traversed or not at execution which is really important. I mean, if, if you can know that you're never using a piece of code that is vulnerable, then there's really no vulnerability. And the other thing is uh, you know, looking at uh, Yara rules. Yara is a pattern matcher, essentially a programmable uh, virus detector, detection engine. And you could think of a vulnerability at the binary level when it's compiled literally as a virus. Conceptually, it's, it's the same kind of thing. It's a problem in your code, and being able to identify it with this kind of tool would be uh, really useful. We're not yet there, but in the future, we will expose the public data creation queue for community to review. And being able to validate that there's vulnerability, uh, which package it applies to, uh, being able to uh, review the severity and the scoring, and, and what are the actual commits are all things that have to be done by actual real humans and persons. So some of the challenge we have there, there's many data sources and there are many cases where this data is redundant, unstructured, messy. And frankly, uh, we thought, you know, with a lot of hubris that uh, uh, we were being exploited by commercial vendors in the space, but we really appreciate more the complexity of the task and why uh, there's been commercial vendors there. It's a lot of work. It's complex. It's everything but easy. Um, and there's the other thing also is that, as I said, there's a lot of uh, uh, tendency to go with uh, bigger and better. Uh, sorry, bigger database. Uh, and it's not always better. For instance, uh, keeping all vulnerabilities on Windows 95 is, is really useless. I mean, nobody cares for that. Um, so you can claim that if you have 5,000 vulnerabilities on, on Windows 95, that you have a bigger database of non-vulnerabilities, but it's not really useful. And, and same thing, we, we don't care about hardware. We don't care about commercial only software. We would care about things which would be at kind of alpha and alpha, like uh, MySQL would be a good example. We may care about um, software development kits and compilers, even if they're proprietary, because they may be used also to develop uh, free and open source code, but hardware definitely out of the out of the scope. 
Another challenge, license of data source. Uh, we want the data to be uh, under CC0. Uh, that means a public domain license. So it's available for free to everyone, at least at a, as an aggregate. But many data sources lack an explicit license. And some of them, for instance, are really problematic, like SUSE, which provides uh, um, data in XML format for CVRF, which happens to be under a CC BY non-commercial license, which is a non-open source, non-free license, which means that this data is out of reach. We've effectively did build a parser, but we cannot aggregate and redistribute that to everyone in aggregated form. And that's something, uh, maybe there's, there's someone on uh, on the SUSE side that's linked, listening today. It's something we need to reach out to SUSE in any case to, to fix, but it's I'm not picking on SUSE. It's one of the many uh, source uh, that's problematic, but there's a lot of them which are. And so future plan, we're adding more data sources. Um, we are right now, build, we did build a, a bit of a UI and uh, minimal UI, and we're establishing a website and an API for data consumption. Um, and also provide a, 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 a dump of the reference data, which something that can be reproduced by anyone in any case, because uh, uh, all the code is there. Um, we're also looking at uh, doing some machine learning in a, a very specific and focused way, which is to focus on data quality and how it can be improved. And we've been starting to, to work with uh, a few uh, like-minded open source projects. Uh, Eclipse Study, I talked about that. They have a project where they actually publish known commit that impact and fix uh, security vulnerabilities, uh, which is something that we talked about. The uh, Evony that uh, Google is also publishing something similar, uh, uh, and it's called Volcom DB, and Fathan, which is a project from the European Union, sponsored by European Union, is looking for this kind of data. So we're trying together, being like-minded about open data for security, trying to to come with a, eventually a shared solution. In any case, we're talking, we're collaborating, exchanging ideas, and eventually exchanging data, uh, aggregating them together and exchanging code. And we're thinking about potentially building a, a neutral consortium or joining some foundation of sorts to make sure that uh, uh, we make this effort about open data sustainable. It's not free. Uh, you know, we've been lucky to, to have been helped by Google with a summer of code and, and NLNet for, uh, with a grant through the European Union. Uh, but this is a lot of work. And I think it's really worse to have something that's available for free to everyone. We just want to make sure that we can build commands together which are sustainable. And that's pretty much it. So uh, we're just right there in the time slot. And the question are, so if I'm looking right now at the, the chats, uh, Dennis is asking, will reproducible builds help in that system? Uh, yes, it can. Um, it's, it's more on the detection of packages that reproducible builds can help because with reproducible build, you can be guaranteed that package version 1.0 and package installed here and package version 1.0 uh, build there and installed there is bit for bit the same. So it helps with the detection of packages. And because it helps with detection of packages, that means it will help uh, also de facto with the referencing of vulnerabilities in that package if you, you're you able to detect it exactly. Um, it can be difficult otherwise. Think about Go executables, which are all statically linked uh, executable or uh, Rust or Haskell. Um, it's not only trivial to figure out what is the source code that ends up in a Go binary. And that means if you have a library which is vulnerable that you've bundled it, uh, finding out what it's made of is difficult. Of course, if you're in a white box open source context, that's that's easier. 
but otherwise it's not totally trivial. So that's where reproducible build could help. Uh, so Kevin is asking, will vulnerable code allow for imports of NVD, so the National Vulnerability Database, for linking to vulnerable code issues? Uh, so I'm assuming when you say vulnerable code issues, you mean uh, vulnerabilities. So the answer is yes. We've built an in importer to uh, import the National Database, uh, but we we're also relying more on primary, more primary source. I consider NVD in some ways as secondary data source. Uh, a primary data source would be the set of uh, data published by OpenSSL is the primary data source. And so, yes, it's, it's entirely, it's entirely the, the plan. It's already there. And uh, um, we've also published uh, something which is a mapping of a crude first pass mapping of the CPs, so the common platform enumeration, which are used to identify uh, packages in national reality database or software or hardware and software product at large uh, to package URLs. And will vulnerable code be linked to OBS? Sure, I'd love to, I'd love to, that would be awesome. Uh, uh, right now, we, we, we spent quite a bit of time to, to actually uh, 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 collect all the data from uh, OpenSUSE. Um, as I said, the, just as an example, again, I'm, I'm not, Speaking on OpenSUSE in, in any case in, in particular, it's just an example, and we're at the Open the SUSE conference, so an OpenSUSE conference. So I thought it was fair game to discuss that a bit. Uh, this is an example of the CVRF data from uh, uh, the security feeds provided by uh, by SUSE, which are under this non-commercial license. Uh, but when I said the things is a bit messy, uh, we have CVRF. We also have a, a bunch of YAML data for backports, and we have oval data. And all these, they're about different sets of angle, eventually redundant data. Uh, uh, so that said, uh, we, we will definitely uh, make that available in, uh, to be consumable in, in, in OBS. So whether that's through API calls or having an a copy and maintain a known full database, uh, your own full database locally. Uh, uh, eventually, we want to have this in a federated way, so there's no one entity that controls the data, which has been the, the problem that's been plaguing that that between code industry so far. Okay, and uh, Kevin says so we need to ensure we can map, link map, NVDs and CV for compliance. Yes, definitely. So that's for the OBS. Um, uh, again, so not only you, you'll be able to, to do that, uh, today we're also using <laughs> SUSE data, which is probably something that you also reference in, uh, in OBS in some ways. Um, the thing that's different is that we have not only SUSE data, but if you look at some of the, the data source we have, uh, in terms of importers, we're looking at Alpine, Linux, Arch, Debian, either directly or through Oval. Uh, we're looking at Gen2, at NPM, Red Hat, uh, .NET, Ruby, Rust, and, 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 and quite a few others. Uh, in some cases, we're limited by some uh, license constraint. There's another com non-commercial license for SafetyDB, which is a, a this database of uh, Python packages, uh, Python packages vulnerabilities, which is also, again, we're providing the code to parse that, but it's unusable from uh, 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 in a commercial environment. And commercial means absolutely uh, everything and nothing. Uh, and, and that's typically not the kind of things we want to have as a restriction when we do uh, open source code at all. Um, Oh, so that's the MACAT. <laughs> so uh, Phil is asking, does the attacker need the MAC address of the Bluetooth chip to be able to uh, 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 perform this attack on the Bluetooth? Um, actually, uh, I think there's a video that you can find on, 
on uh, it's called bleeding tooth you have a video that's available on youtube which you can look at here and i'm gonna paste that in the chat so you can actually look at that well actually we can look at it together it's it's a very small video um, on the left you have the attacking laptop on the right you have the attack laptop they're both running ubuntu but that's uh, that's irrelevant and uh, basically gnome calculator was popping up on the right uh, just the the only thing that was been happening as far as i understand uh, and it took 14 seconds so the only thing that's been happening there was uh, uh, to uh, have uh, just your bluetooth turned on but i didn't read everything it just happens that i turned off uh, my Bluetooth when I saw that earlier today. Um, so that's for Philippe. And uh, Marina asked me, have you ever contacted the, the security team at Suze? No, not yet. Not yet. So definitely uh, that's part of the things to do. Again, discussing on uh, a couple of things. Uh, reusing this data uh, probably makes sense for you guys and for Suze in general. Um, for any security team and any software developers, uh, it makes sense too. And second, being able to ensure that the, we can more easily aggregate the data, CVRF data in particular from uh, uh, SUSE would be super, super useful. Um, and again, at the moment, we have uh, uh, quite a few source. Uh, there's, there's been a few uh, examples in the past um, um, by the way, that's an interesting blog post to read if you want to understand why there are problems. So that's one of the companies that that deals with uh, um, uh, that deals with uh, proprietary, uh, which provides proprietary into the database. They explain why using CPs, which is the identifier used in the national database, is a problem. Um, and the, you want to read that. But so the, the thing is uh, being able to share and reshare this data back would be uh, super useful for everyone. Um, eventually, when you think of it, there's a lot of distri distribution uh, uh, collaboration that's taking place uh, on the one end across uh, RPM-based distros and the other end across Debian-based distros, but not only, and all the distros are talking together. We're talking together on a regular basis at, at various venues like uh, Virtuas FOSDEM, which will take place virtually in, in, in Brussels in, in February. Um, there's no reason that we shouldn't, wouldn't be able to do the same on, on security and, and uh, the scope and a lot of the security work has been done traditionally by distros, uh, but a lot of the issues nowadays not only come from distros, but they also, also come from application packages. Um, uh, be it uh, OpenSSL um, or Struts, uh, which were the two most prominent ones in the last uh, couple of years. Um, and so um, being able to share that would be great, Marina. Any other question? Oh, and there is a talk from the security team. So yeah, I'll be, I'll make sure I'll join. Um, I'll look at the, the calendar. And so that's pretty much it. So the code is available on GitHub um, on uh, vulnerable code. And, and again, so the, the thing that distinguishes this from other uh, experience in the domain, there's the project which I like very much called CV Search, uh, which provides some aggregated data uh, and they're good friends. We're collaborating. Eventually, we'll want to share our data with them so they can integrate it, integrate that in their tool. They have a very CV-centric view of the world. CV is the, the ID provided to vulnerability when it's integrated in the national vulnerability database. And by the way, when I say national, it really means uh, American, uh, really, than uh, national, whatever country you're from. Um, and the eventually we'd like to have vulnerabilities from uh, every vulnerabilities being also referenced there uh, but 
the, the efforts and, and the, the bar to actually contribute a new vulnerability is quite high. Um, so we will work when we establish a community to ensure that all our vulnerabilities are also contributed upstream to the national vulnerability database and we'll use CVs. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll have also the transient and intermediary IDs for things that are not yet referenced there or that may not be uh, of interest there. Again, there's quite a bit of ceremony to make sure you can reference things. Nevertheless, the, the big difference is here, we're talking about CPEs and we're talking about package URLs. And um, uh, so it's written in Python. Oh, I, I didn't point, I forgot about mentioning that the architecture, sorry. Uh, well, where is the architecture? Hmm. Okay. Well, there was there was a slide about architecture, uh, but it's not there. It's written in Python. Uh, it's Apache licensed, and uh, it uses uh, Django and Postgres as a base. Um, and that's the gist of it. There's a lot of tests, uh, which is uh, the normal thing to do when when you do uh, this kind of software, any kind of software, anyway. Um, and as I said, you can find it on, on GitHub. Uh, and I thought I had a slide in architecture, but it's not there. And that's pretty much it. So if there's uh, no other question, I can stay a couple minutes around. And yes, that's the talk. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So not great. Thank you, Marina. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Any any other questions? So, if you're interested in security, definitely uh, there's a you 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 absolutely want to join that uh, that session which is taking place tomorrow at uh, twelve thirty UTC, which means ten thirty Central European time. And if you're on the West Coast in California, um, that would be 1.30 p.m. A.M., sorry, 1.30 in the morning, which is okay. It's, 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 it's better than the 3.30 um, a.m. Um, Eastern time if you're in the U.S. on the, the East Coast. Okay. All right, thank you very much. I look forward to see you on uh, my next talk, which is, uh, actually, let me put a link if you're interested in that, uh, which is here. Uh, well, I'll be talking about one of the applications of that database, which is a new tool to do a static analysis of uh, Docker containers and, and virtual machine and, and root file system, things like that. And one of the applications of the, this volunteer database will be able to find package level vulnerabilities that may exist in both application and system packages and else of present and use in these containers. So I've pasted the link in the chat and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And which means that, uh, oh, which means I, I'm on video now. Okay, though. All right, thank you very much for your time and uh, see you online.